Our next chapter 22 is entitled International Environmental Policy, Acid Rain. Acid rain is a phenomenon of rain or snow which is more acidic than natural falling on the environment. Now, rainwater is naturally somewhat acidic. In other words, it doesn't have a pH of 7. But when we talk about acid rain, we're talking about rain which is more acidic than it naturally ought to be. Acid rain is caused primarily by sulfur dioxide, SO2. As I think we've mentioned earlier in this semester, the main source of sulfur dioxide pollution is burning coal. Pure coal wouldn't have any sulfur and therefore wouldn't be generating SO2, but coal in nature exists with sulfur as a contaminant and when you burn coal, burning of course means chemically combining with oxygen, then you inevitably burn the sulfur that's the contaminant within the coal and that causes SO2, sulfur dioxide. Then the sulfur dioxide goes out of the smokestack, it goes into clouds and it causes acidification of the water that's in the clouds and so when the water falls as rain or snow it's more acidic than it naturally ought to be. Sulfur dioxide is the main cause of acid rain. It's not the only cause of acid rain. The nitrous oxides uh, here, uh, NO and NO2, as I mentioned earlier this semester, we, we sometimes call these NOx, NO with an X subscript, are, is another cause of acid rain. And there are more minor ones, um, chlorine ions, the book mentions at one point, particulate matter over here, the book mentions at another point, but we won't really talk much more about those because those are pretty minor sources. The very first observation that trees were dying near a place uh, where some kind of industrial activity was going on goes back actually to the ancient Roman Empire. In terms of acid rain, the connection between coal burning and forests dying was made in the mid-19th century in the UK. In response, the British government in 1863 passed what was called the Alkali Act, which attempted to limit the, burn the combustion of coal in order to try to protect forests. So, although the chemistry wasn't, wasn't understood at that time, the connection between coal burning and dead trees was, was made. Next is the scale of the acid rain. Acid rain scale, as I wrote here, is a scale of several hundred kilometers. So when the SO2 gets emitted from, let's say, the coal-fired power plant, uh, it doesn't tend to fall right away. It tends to be carried by the winds a few hundred kilometers before it falls. And therefore, the as that, that's why the, the title of this chapter is International Environmental Policy, because it often uh, crosses international boundaries. And so the nation that emits the pollution to some extent is not the nation that suffers the pollution. Uh, an important example is Eastern Canada when the problem of acid rain first grew to great prominence in the Western Hemisphere it was because forests in Quebec and further east in the maritime provinces of Canada were dying and the cause once it was understood that th this was because of acid rain then it was clear that the cause was primarily power plants in the US Midwest states like Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, that that part of the United States because the prevailing winds took the pollution created by those plants and transported them further east and a little bit further north into Canada. We're also going to talk about uh, northern, central, and eastern Europe. The United Kingdom doesn't receive much acid rain from anywhere else. It might receive a tiny bit from Ireland, but not very much. However, the UK deposits, or I should say deposited, quite a lot of SO2 pollution uh, 
or was responsible for quite a lot of SO2 pollution that was deposited in countries like France and Germany, but especially in the Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland. Uh, I indeed, in, a, in, in the case of a country like Norway, the vast majority of the SO2 that was damaging Norwegian forests was not created by Norway. It was created by other countries, and primarily by the UK. Um, similarly, the forests that were dying in Germany were uh, we're, we're dying because of emissions caused for the West in, in France, uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, uh, the UK, and, and the forests dying in Eastern Europe were caused by emissions from countries like Germany as well as the ones farther, uh, farther to the West. So that's the scale of these problems. Your book has a, an interesting cost-benefit analysis at the end of the chapter, which I wanted to go through now. What the book does is to study, uh, as a date, the early 1990s, the harms in the UK caused by SO2 emissions. And these numbers, so we're going to discuss uh, numbers here, these numbers are given in pounds sterling per kilogram of SO2 per year. So that's the, those are the units of the damage. The primary source of damage, let me mark it over this way, the primary source of damage was damage to forests. So that was the main source of damage. And you see the number was about 0.6 uh, pounds sterling per kilogram of SO2 per year. A pound sterling is worth a little bit more, or somewhat more than a US dollar. So the, the main damage it was being caused, the main damage of each, that each kilogram of SO2 emitted caused was to forests. Uh, number two was corrosion of the exterior of buildings. Here you can see the number is uh, 0 0.4, which is less than the 0 0.6 of damage to forests. The damage to buildings are because if you have a stone on the exterior of a building, then the acid rain eats away at the stone. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. So this is the magazine Foreign Affairs, which I think I've mentioned before, the title of this article, How the Cold War Politics Helped Solve a Climate Crisis in 2015. But the point I wanted to make here was to show you this photograph. And the caption of the photograph says, Gargoyle Damaged by Acid Rain. So this is a uh, gargoyle from, I suppose, uh, uh, the medieval period. The caption says, uh, Munich uh, New Town Hall 2006, so München Neues Rathaus. Um, and you can see that the, the fine details of the stone have been corroded away, and the reason is acid rain. You can see this in other places. You can see it in the famous Acropolis in Athens, Greece, where you have temples from ancient Greece. Um, these have been, the carvings there have been damaged by acid rain. You can even see it in a fairly new building. The US Supreme Court building is only about a century old. And it has carvings in stone uh, on the building. And those carvings have been damaged by, by acid rain as well. So that's the building exterior damage. The next line here is crop damage, which the book doesn't say very much about, and crop damage is quite a bit less than the other two lines. The next line is even more speculative here, damage to human health. Um, the book says rather little about that, and I haven't read much about uh, damage to human health in regards to acid rain. The book doesn't talk about the next thing, damage to aquatic life, or at least the, the, the book doesn't, in its little cost-benefit analysis, doesn't try to quantify the damage to aquatic life. But certainly besides dying forests, one of the things that was observed is that in areas where you had acidic rain, you had dying fish. And for a long time, it was not 
understood why the fish were dying. Because if you take exactly the same species of fish and you put them in a laboratory aquarium and you acidify the water in exactly the same kind of way that acid rain causes, the fish don't die. In fact, the fish are perfectly fine. It was finally discovered that there are two somewhat indirect mechanisms that are causing fish death in areas where you have acid rain. One is that the organisms that the fish eat which are much smaller than the fish, kind of microscopic organisms. These can die if the water becomes too acidic. And so the fish are basically starving to death. They're not being indirectly killed by the acidification, but their prey is being killed by the acidification. The other mechanism is even more indirect. It turns out that aluminum ions are chemically combined with the soil that forms lake beds. And as long as the water stays its natural pH, the aluminum ions stay chemically combined with the lake bed, and they don't get into the water. But if you acidify the lake water, it turns out that the chemical bonds between the aluminum ions and the soil that constitute the lake bed, those chemical bonds break. The aluminum ions then diffuse into the water, and it turns out they are poisonous to fish. So fish can be killed by the alum aluminum ions that are coming from the lake bed because the chemistry of the water has changed and these ions are being liberated. So those are two indirect uh, mechanisms that cause the death of fish. So as I said, the book doesn't include those in, in the cost-benefit analysis. What it does is then to add up the, the damages that it does quantify, you get here an approximate total. What the book wanted to do next was say, well, if we're trying to convince the UK public to decrease SO2 emissions, they may not care about the SO2 emissions that fall on other countries. So let's just calculate the, the damage that UK SO2 emissions are causing to the UK itself that decreases this 1.17 number way down to approximately 0.25 because the vast majority of damage that UK SO2 emissions were doing was damage to other countries, not damage to the UK. But there still was some damage to the UK and that was about 0.25. And the final step is to say, well, SO2 isn't the only thing that causes acid rain. There are also uh, nitrous oxide emissions and, as I mentioned before, particulate emissions. And so the 0 0.25 figure is an underestimate because the 0 0.25 figure is only taking SO2 into account. If you take not only SO2 but also the nitrous oxides and the particulates into account, then your final number here is 0 0.375. And so that is the marginal cost of SO, SO2 emission. Well, acid, let me just say acid rain emissions because it's not just SO2. That's the marginal cost of acid rain emissions uh, expressed, as I said, in, in uh, pounds sterling per kilogram of so SO2 equivalent per year. And the equivalence is explained in, in the book, how they, how they form the equivalent of nitrous oxides and particulates to SO2. So that's the marginal cost of pollution. It follows that it's also the marginal benefit of getting rid of pollution. So the marginal benefit of getting rid of this pollution is 0 0.375 uh, British pounds sterling per kilogram of SO2 per year. What's the cost of getting rid of acid rain pollution? Well, that's here, page 304, the marginal abatement cost is a graph on page 304 of what the marginal abatement cost is. And it hits the, the magic 0 0.375 number at about 74% of 1980 level SO2 emissions. So what that means is even if you even if the UK just cares about the UK itself and not any other countries, it would still be worthwhile to decrease UK SO2 emissions by 74% over uh, below their 1980 level. So you can see that 
acid rain causes a lot of damage, certainly a lot of damage compared to the marginal abatement cost. And so quite a bit of decrease in SO2 emissions is economically worthwhile, even if countries only care about themselves. Okay, I think I'll stop now. We'll get to uh, the next topic, control technology, in the next video.